Hello, everybody. My name is Deirdre Nocton, and I'm a member of the Library and Archive Committee who coordinate the RDS Library Speaker Series. Details of the RDS Library and Archives and its wide ranging collections, including an online digital archive and its activities, can be found by visiting the RDS website at www.rds.ie. It is my pleasure today to welcome you to this event as part of the Library Speaker Series in association with One Dublin, One Book. We're delighted to present award-winning writer Donald Ryan in conversation with Ronan Hessian, author of this year's One Dublin, One Book Choice, Leonard and Hungry Paul, about becoming a writer, allowing time for creativity in a busy life, and what they have learned along the way to publication. Ronan Hessian is an Irish writer based in Dublin. His debut novel, Leonard and Hungry Paul, was published by Blue Moose Books in the UK and by Melville House Books in the US. Leonard and Hungry Paul has been nominated for a number of prizes, including the Irish Novel of the Year and the British Book Award for Best Debut. Ronan has also been longlisted long -listed for on post Irish Book Awards, the short story of the year. His second novel, Anenka, will be published in May 2021. As Mumbling Death Row, he has released three albums of storytelling songs. His third album, Dictionary Crimes, was nominated for the Choice, for the Choice Music Prize for Irish Album of the Year. Donal Ryan is from Nina in County Tipperary. He is the author of five number one best-selling novels and a short story collection. He has won several awards for his fiction, including four Irish Book Awards, the Guardian First Book Award, and the European Union Prize for Literature. And he's twice been nominated for the Booker Prize. His work has been adapted for stage and screen, and it's published in over 20 languages. He teaches creative writing at the University of Limerick title of the presentation is Eight Days a Week, Developing as a Writer in the Real World. Please enjoy. Hi everyone, um, it's my pleasure to be here with Ronan Hessian, the author of this year's choice for One Dublin, One Book, Leonard and Hungry Paul. And what a choice it is. Leonard and Hungry Paul is the kind of book that works its way from the first line, not just into its readers' imaginations or their affections, but into their lives. It's populated by two of the finest and funniest creations in all of fiction, the eponymous Leonard and Hungry Paul. It's a book about friendship, family, love, loneliness. It's an instruction manual for mindfulness. It's a work of effortless comedic brilliance. It is above all, a celebration of kindness. I first came across this book in 2019 at the UL Winter School in Doolan County Clare, when I encountered my friend and colleague, Kit Val clutching the book to her heart like this. And I must say, I felt a stab of jealousy because I'm Kit's favorite Irish writer. So who's this Roland Hitchin guy stamping onto my turf? Um, but I read this opening line at Kit's behest. Leonard was raised by his mother alone with cheerfully concealed difficulty, his father having died tragically during childbirth. What an opening line. So my jealousy was soon drowned by admiration. I read on and felt very strongly that I was reading a book that would change lives, a book that would be a force for good, a book that would lift hearts and bolster souls. And so it is. So it's such a pleasure, Ronan, and I'm so happy that this book has been chosen as this year's One Dublin, One Book. Um, would you like to start by reading some um, a, a, a excerpt from this beautiful book? Thanks very much, Don, and thanks for that, that very generous introduction and be delighted to. So I'm going to read from chapter one, which is just called Leonard. Brilliant. Leonard was raised by his mother alone with cheerfully concealed difficulty, his father having died tragically during childbirth. So she was not by nature the soldiering type. She taught him to look at life as a daisy chain of small events, each of which could be made manageable in its own way. She was a person for whom kindness was a very ordinary thing, who believed that the only acceptable excuse 
for not having a bird feeder in the back garden was that you had one in the front garden. As sometimes happens with boys who prefer games to sports, Leonard had few friends, but lots of ideas. His mother understood with intuitive good sense that children like Leonard just need someone to listen to them. They would set off to the shops discussing conger eels and have a deep conversation about Saturn's moons on the way back. They would talk about tidal waves at bath time and say goodnight with a quick chat about the man with the longest fingernails in the Guinness Book of World Records. But Leonard grew up at a time when quiet, imaginative children did not yet enjoy the presumption of innocence. His mother often found herself having to take his side against ornery teachers who complained that they found it impossible to get through to him. With patient maternal endurance, she would sit by herself at parent-teacher meetings, explaining that like his late father, he just lacked a eureka face. Even into his thirties, Leonard's mother still liked to fuss over him, buying his favorite ham for lunch, the one with fewer veins running through it, leaving tea by the bedside for when he woke up and ironing well-meaning creases into his jeans, which Leonard would quietly iron out later. He repaid her thoughtfulness by keeping her company through her later years and generally including her in the uncrowded bandwidth of his life. She had never really asked Leonard about girls, knowing the delicacy of the subject for him, and also because of her own doubts about whether his apparently celibate life was due to a lack of interest or opportunity. For Leonard, the fact that he still lived at home with his mother led to a certain self-restraint on practical grounds. He had wondered what would have happened had he brought a girl home only for them to wake up to two cups of tea at the bedside the next morning. His mother passed away unexpectedly one midweek night in her sleep, tucked into a duvet with her clothes all laid out for the next day, her neatness being a sign of her respect for the small things in her life. The doctor noted the cause of death as a heart attack, but emphasized that there were no signs of suffering or drama. He said that her heart must have simply run out of beats. So I'll leave it there. Oh, it's so beautiful. It's such a beautiful and perfect and unexpected portrait of parental love. And I think it's testament to your skill and testament to the love you obviously have for your characters that Leonard's mum passes away on page two or three of the book, I think, page two actually, um, and the reader is heartbroken after her because she becomes such a complete and rounded character in that small space of time. It's just so gorgeous. Um, and because I have no confidence in my my skill as an interviewer, I started in a panic. Um, I, I embarked on a trawl through um, a reread of your interviews last night. And I stopped actually at the first one I came across because there was so much in it. Um, it's when you spoke to Sue Leonard before the book came out, actually, um, in the Examiner, in the Beginner's Pluck um, um, column. And you said something about Leonard, about seeing and meeting people like Leonard in life um, and, and people who have a kind of a quiet, unobtrusive way about them, um, but who have so much going on. Um, can you tell us a bit about that, about the origins of the book and, and the characters in this? Yeah, Leonard was the, was the first character who came to me. Um, I, I had been carrying around this idea of a sort of gentle, quiet man who, who had was carrying some sort of cloud of melancholy. Uh, and I began to sort of notice people in life uh, who were sort of quiet and unassuming. And, and I'm a civil servant, as I know your, your background is too. And the civil service is full of people like that. Yeah. These sort of very sort of quiet, sort of gentle, thoughtful mm. people. And when you get to know them, they're very interesting. They have a lot of uh, deep thoughts. And once I started thinking about that sort of person as a type, I sort of saw Leonard's everywhere. Uh, and he, he, he took more and more shape. And I decided I would try and get to know him. So I, it was it was early, I think, February 2017. So I had a new diary. Uh, and I said, I'm going to write about him every day to get to know him. And after the second day, I said, forget it. I'm just going to try and write a novel about this guy. Um, and what I sort of found with the characters in the book and, and any characters I've written since is that they're sort of revealed very gradually. You know, they're not, they're not designed, you know, I don't sort of, sit down and sketch them. I'm not the kind of person who will make a list of all the preferences of the character to really get under them. I, I, I meet them through the book and through a very 
it's almost like restoring a painting. You know, you're, you're taking off very subtle layers of varnish one after another until eventually you start to hit what you feel is the core of the character. Um, and, and so that's where Leather came from. That's really interesting. And I love that idea of the character revealing themselves to you gradually as you write the book. Um, and there's a real sense of Leonard actually coming to know things about himself in the book as well, um, particularly with his relationship with Shelley. I won't give too much away now because we don't want to give spoilers for people who haven't read the book. And if you haven't read it, you have to read it. Um, and it's such a beautiful thing. Um, and at, at the core of the book, of course, is this very quiet um, but very profound friendship between Leonard and Hungry Paul. And Hungry Paul is just such a, a fascinating character in so many ways because he, he lives such a quiet life. Um, he's so undramatic, um, but he has such a, a gorgeous, chaotic discourse going on inside himself and he's so interested. And he really, I mean, I don't think the word mindfulness is used at any point in the book, but he is the most naturally mindful character I've ever come across. I think his dad describes him as, as a weir. Um, so water just washes over him. The waters of life wash over him. And at one point, a character points out that when wine spills um, in the book, um, that Hungry Paul has no reaction to the fact that the wine is spilt. He just goes about cleaning it up because the wine is spilt now. So there's no point in having a reaction to that because it's passed. And so he's focused on that moment, the present moment, and the task of cleaning it up. It's a really gorgeous thing to come across in fiction, that, that absolute um, self-possession and presence and mindfulness. Yeah, I wanted Hungry Paul. I think, I, think, I think what makes Hungry Paul sort of different in the book is that I think with all the other characters, they go through change. You know, you show them, see them at the beginning in a steady state. They go through a bit of a change and you see them at a, a new steady state. Yeah. Whereas I think with Hungry Paul, it's probably the reader who changes. Uh, I, I think if you were to say, particularly in Ireland, if you were to say to people, I know this guy, he's in his early 30s. He doesn't really have a proper job and he lives at home with his parents. What most people would say is, that's all I need to know. Yeah. Tell me no more. Uh, it's not going to be the person you're going to say to a, a single woman, uh, I've got just a guy for you. <laughs> uh, so so, so what, he, what, what sort of appears as, as sort of an obliviousness really it's just he's, on, on the one hand, completely self-contained and on the other hand, completely connected. Yes. Uh, so he's he's not trying to manipulate the world using his thoughts. He's, he's not trying to frame the world at all. He's not trying to shape it. Uh, and he doesn't use opinions and, you know, pos intellectual positions to try and say the world is this way or that way. He just sort of synchronizes with it, uh, and that—that's what I think makes him different. So he, he, I think, as we go through the book, we realize that what appear, you know, he's talked about in the book. You know, it, it, he's not really yes. confronted about his life until late on in the book. But what we find out is that he is—he has actually got very good self-awareness and self-acceptance. That's the thing, and it's so interesting, actually, what you said about the, the reader changing and not the character, um, because that's such an unusual thing, actually, in fiction, because we're so used to the kind of the trope in, in fiction and in art in general, you know, in, in any kind of storytelling form of an apotheosis or some kind of change for the character. But the fact that Hungry Paul is just so steadfast in himself for the whole book and actually isn't judged by any other character, except, um, strangely, but perhaps inevitably by his sister Grace, who loves him dearly, um, but... And they have a very profound conversation, a very easy conversation in a bathroom um, towards the end of the novel that I won't again go into because it's, it might be a bit of a spoiler, but it's a very profound moment of realisation for, for Grace. And she becomes a proxy for the reader in that moment because she has to change how she sees Hungry Paul as well in that moment. Yeah, I think so. And I, I think the, the sort of seeds of that conversation are, are sown very early on in the novel, in, in the fourth chapter, where there's a scene where Grace is Hungry Paul's older sister, and um, when he was young, he goes to take a fiver out of his pocket, you know, the little tight pocket yeah. that jeans have, um, which I'm told is for coins. Other people have told me it's for condoms, but whatever. whatever. <laughs> it's the small, the small pocket. Uh, and he rips it. Uh, and she immediately replaces that. But she swaps it, and gives mm. him the fiver. And he goes off back to his life, uh, ever self-contained. And I suppose what, what Grace... Grace is, is somebody who... Um, has always lived up to the expectations of her. Uh, and the problem is when people do that from a young age, as, as I think many of us do, nobody ever turns that off. Nobody comes back and says, okay, you don't need to be 
carrying the weight of the world anymore. Uh, and going into that conversation, I was very conscious that it's a sort of male-female dynamic. And she actually, there's two things she wants from that conversation. One is for Hungry Paul to take ownership of his life and also to take his responsibility for his parents. Uh, and in that conversation, she gets both of those things, but not in the way she asked for them. And I think that's quite important that it's not, I've tried to structure the, the, the relationships so that they're not at each other's expense. So there, there's no, there isn't a victory for anybody in it. It's a resetting. Mm. That's a lovely idea. Yeah, because I mean, it, it, in a way, it's it's a book um, where there is sometimes a notable a notable absence of conflict. Um, and it's to the to, to the better of the book, actually, um, because it unfolds in a way that kind of speaks to Leonard himself and his his unworldliness um, in a way and his innocence. Um, Leonard has to kind of come to a realization at a point in the book about his own grief for his mother, um, about how he feels about things, about, you know, about about who he, exactly he is. Um, and he is um, absolutely lacking in cynicism. Um, and that's a lovely thing again. And I, I think that Leonard, um, you know, it, it's in a lot of ways, Paul seems to be a file for Leonard. Um, it, in other ways, they have the absolute perfect relationship and that they, they seem to slot together so perfectly. Um, as only two quiet men who have a similar worldview can, I think. Um, it's, it's, it's a really lovely friendship. Can you tell us about the friendship that's at the heart of the book um, and, and how you came to, to kind of to create it? Or did it rise like the characters naturally in the writing? I think I sort of recognised pretty early on that a character like Leonard, who is quite gentle and, and quite uh, quiet and, you know, not a sort of typical leading man, mm. would need a foil. Uh, and more generally in the book, the book is sort of told a vignette style. And so each chapter is sort of a, a set piece in its own right. And I realized that one way to look at characters is to put them in different formations. So to have their the chapters, they're in different combinations with each other. And they both talk to each other and about each other. So you get the sort of more of a sort of 360 degree view of the character as opposed to just seeing a single camera. Yes. Uh, and I thought with, I tried to think carefully about what each character would draw out of the other. Uh, and I sort of felt there needed to be a sort of uh, a, a counter Leonard, you know, somebody right, yes, who, who yeah. was, mm. was uh, shared a lot of his the traits to make him special, but, but more so. Uh, and, and also to sort of represent, you know, going back to what I said about it's the reader who changes. I think novels tend to rely, as you say, on conflict and change. And in life, we really focus on change a lot. Say, say for example, at the moment, everyone's talking about what's different. But I think what Hungry Paul stands for is constancy in life. You know, there's a tendency to overlook what doesn't change, which often is the most important stuff. And so he provides that sort of both for Leonard and, and sort of the novel as that sort of reference point of the value of the things that are changing and a sort of a benchmark you can always sort of hold on to. Yeah. So I found the more I got into their dialogue, initially I had to be very careful that they didn't turn into each other. Yeah. You know, because they're, they're close enough yeah. that we're writing the dialogue to try and distinguish them a little bit more. And there are just some subtle things there about you know, the extent to which one or other of them asks questions or doesn't, mm -hmm. to which they finish their points. Like they, they play these board games, but there, there are about five or six different board game pieces in, in but yeah. none, of the, none of the games are finished. Yeah. They don't finish any of the games. So there, there's a complete lack of competitiveness there. It's just a prop for their conversation, which I think, exactly. I think male friendship is often like that. You know, they often say, if you want to talk to a man, you know, bring him for a drive. You know, yeah. if he's staring over the steering wheel, he'll talk more freely than yeah. if you're eyeball to eyeball so it's just trying to introduce a bit of a, a you know these sort of these moments where they can just they flower a little bit that's so true and i love the, the board games and i love the fact that that paul doesn't have a phone and that he leaves these lengthy um voicemails on leonard's phone that uh, you know are, are applied to the phone over numerous and um, different um messages because he runs out of time and it's just so so well done and it's such an unusual thing actually for somebody you know not to have a phone um and it, it comes it's almost a jolt you go oh my god he's never phone how does that work and of course it works really well for hungry paul because it just fits with his lifestyle so completely um and there's a real sense that um 
that they, they need each other ba- badly and that they love each other. And I love the way they refer to each other as, as old pals and old friends throughout the book. It's just such a lovely, easy friendship. You, you can't see them ever falling out. Um, and, you know, I, I did say that there's, you know, an absence of conflict, but of course there is because, I mean, things are changing. Um, Grace's life is changing and things are starting to, to, to mount in Leonard's life as well. Um, and, you know, it, it, strangely, it, it's an absolute page turner. The first time I read Leonard and Hungry Paul, I read it straight through almost in, in one sitting um, because I couldn't stop. I had to find out what was going to happen. Um, it's also one of the funniest books. I think probably the funniest book I've ever read. I mean, there are times when you laugh out loud, mostly when you read, a, you know, a, a book that is that is geared towards comedy. Not saying that the book is geared towards comedy, but there are such intensely comedic moments. Um, you kind of laugh inwardly. You might chuckle to yourself, but I laughed out loud Um so many times, particularly a scene where Hungry Paul takes a box of roses back to a supermarket, and I won't say what happens, but it's just so well done, and it just it it it, it kind of rises so incrementally. You know, all of a sudden there's a crowd around him, and all of a sudden it's a big deal. It's just the funniest thing you know, a comedic scene I've ever read. Um, did you find that a struggle to, to to make these funny things happen? You know, to amuse the reader because even small wry asides, like saying that somebody was somebody who in his younger years would have been one of the lads. You know, it's just such a funny observation to make about somebody's aspect and their bearing. Did you find that a struggle or did it, did it come naturally? I, I think when I was a kid, I, I was, you know, I was from a family of eight children. Uh, so well, it's kind of a crazy house. And so in that situation, any child in a group of other children, but at some stage on a daily basis has been told they're not funny. Uh, <laughs> and, and I'm now in a situation where uh, I have young children, so so they constantly tell me I'm not funny. So it meant that when I was writing the book, and bear in mind writing it without really thinking, I'd end up talking to Donald Ryan on one Dublin one book. And like this is something bashed out on my kitchen table, just sort of entertaining myself, uh, you, you know, and just I suppose trying like like a child playing in a sandpit just for my own uh, enjoyment, just to sort of see where the jokes would go. So not, not particularly trying to write a, a comic novel or, or trying to, to sort of picture these, but just trying to see where I could just take the line. And I think as well, life is like that. I think, you know, even you go to funerals, you know, you will see people sitting outside and they will get in a group, a group and it won't be long before somebody makes a humorous remark. It's just something yeah. we used to do. And humor as well as a pretty... Uh, it's a it's a pretty uh, sometimes it can be a pretty good tool. Humor kind of bypasses your filters. You know, you you can't decide to laugh or not laugh at something. So if you're if you're trying to set the reader up, it is a gamble because if somebody reads the book and doesn't laugh, then unquestionably it hasn't worked for them. Like yeah. there's no way of talking your way out of that. Uh, but at the same time, humor does work to open people up and it's also quite vivid like if you're making a point about something uh, and and it gets through with humor it's smuggled into a person's mind mm-hmm. using humor uh, it, it kind of helps sort of create that world and and um, so so I, I, I like I think it's it's something that's it's risky for a writer to do but at the time I didn't feel the stakes were very high so I just went for it. That's a great. I, lo- I love that, actually, Ronan. I mean, the fact that you say you, you bashed it out on your kitchen table and you didn't feel pressure. Um, and you think that, that that fact allowed you, 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 it did allow you to be free and to take all these risks. Um, but it must have been a struggle all the same, you know, to, to be so busy um, and to have so many responsibilities and to try to take this time in each day, maybe not daily now, but I mean, it must be a struggle to get the book written. How did you find that? Well, my, my approach, my background is in music, so I, I had I had... Each, I'd done three albums and each album took five years. Wow. So I, I would have no problem waiting for six months just for an, a, sort of an melody to sort of turn into a song. And, and you know, I had no problem waiting. So I'd had a five year break without doing anything. So there was a build up of that creative energy. And what I did is I sat down at, at 10 o'clock every night, uh, six nights a week, and wrote for two, two and a half hours. Uh, and I got the first draft done in about three months and then took a month off and then went back editing and had a few cycles of that. So we've done further refinements and um, uh, worked it back. But I've always sort of had a sort of secret superhero existence outside of my day job, you know, <laughs> music or, uh, you know, uh, my, my creative side. So, but but I think it's something I probably get asked most often, more than about the book or, you know, the background was fitting it in around 
family life. Mm. And I think probably all first novels are written that way. You know, I think it's probably the first thing a writer learns is where to find those gaps. Like I remember reading about Yoko Ogawa, the uh, Japanese writer, her first novel, a novella, won the, the main literary prize in Japan called the Akutagawa Prize. And she wrote that when her first child was born. And every time she changed the nappy, she wrote one sentence. Every time she made a meal, she wrote one sentence. Uh, so it's funny. I think one thing about true creativity, when you know that you're really onto an idea, is that it comes with its its own energy. It has, a, you know, it, it comes with an endowment of energy. So it's not un, unreasonable. You get the idea, but you're also sort of giving a certain amount of energy to execute it. Yes. And I think that comes with it. So you sort of feel... The hard thing is going to sleep afterwards, you know, when you've been sitting, chuckling at your own mm. jokes at the laptop for two yeah. and a half hours, and then you kind of sneak into bed <laughs> uh, when, when, the, when the rest of the house is asleep, um, your kind of mind is fizzing. But uh, you know, I think it's it's something I've just come to accept in my my day. My hours are pretty much all accounted for between my various responsibilities. Brilliant. I, I, that's lovely idea of um, of getting into bed afterwards and still yeah and still living in the book in the moment. I remember doing that. I remember going to bed um, because I wrote my first novel as well between usually between nine and midnight and I'd go to bed and I'd have to get back up again. You know a lot because something else would occur to me. Um, and that's the thing. I mean, you know, your, your hours would be accounted for. Um, and that idea of I, I, to be honest, to, to me, it's an, an alien concept. The idea of just being a writer of books and nothing else, and I, I can't imagine having these vast swathes of empty time just filled with words. It happened to be just once in my life for about four months. <laughs> I wasn't keen on it to be honest. So, I mean, my colleague Joseph O'Connor um, says that no one should just be a writer; that you have to have something else going on. And of course, you know, for most of us, unless we have um, hugely um, successful commercial books. Um, you know, it, it, it'll be very hard to make a good living just from being a writer. So it's something that a lot of us just have to fit in and um, we have to account for our hours. Um, you know, I was I was reminded a lot reading the book, not in content or theme or tone even, of Ignatius J. Riley from um, John Kennedy Tools, A Confederacy of Dunces. <laughs> but in a lot of ways, Leonard and Hungry Paul, and Paul especially, are, are, are anti-Ignatiuses because they are just so kind. And Ignatius doesn't show much kindness in, in that book. And actually, and, and I think Leonard and Hungry Paul is a lot funnier. But they are those kind of, they feel iconic. They feel like iconic comic creations. Um, and I, when I first read the book, I said, this feels like a cult classic. Um, do you enjoy, I mean, how do you feel about people taking the books to their hearts? Do, does, it, does it ever worry you or is it, you know, a source of joy for you? Because it is the kind of book that people do seem to absolutely love, you know, that, that, that really wins its way into their souls, into their being. How do you find um, negotiating the, the, the world of, of readers now that you are a writer? Yeah, it's an interesting one. In a strange way, and you probably won't believe me when I say this, but I actually don't take the book personally at all. Like, I don't, I don't like... I don't, uh, when people sort of say nice things about the book, I'm very proud of the book, as, but I sort of, it's a bit like watching your your child uh, being popular in the playground. You're, ha you're happy for them and in a sort of reflected way, happy. But I, I, I suppose in music, I remember when I used to play music, I remember playing, my, my biggest ever gig was probably 200 people. And then I was playing a show where I was playing to 2,000 people. So it's a huge step up in size. And trying to get my head around it, I, I just, I, I thought about two things. Uh, one, which uh, some people, one person who really inspires me is the the, the jazz saxophonist, uh, Sonny Rollins. Uh, and when my kids were young and I used to sort of, when they were babies and I used to stay up late at night trying to keep some portion of my life for myself, I used to love watching uh, Sonny Rollins' uh, stuff on, on YouTube. And I sort of learned from just watching him that he, he stays close to his audience by staying close to his, his music. He doesn't let anything come between himself and his music. And that then projects outwards. So you don't need to manage all the people. The other thing I think I learned was that um, it, it's still a one-to-one -one relationship. So if it, it, it's a one-to-one -one multiplied by a thousand as opposed to one to mm -hmm. a thousand. So you don't need to have the the, the huge personality or the huge uh, projection to be able to absorb uh, the feedback from people. It is one to one always. Uh, so the so writing sort of stays intimate, uh, and that's the way I try and look at it. It's sort of a transaction. I think that that it's a bit like the way television works. You know that an image 
is in one machine, it's transported to something else and then is downloaded as an image at the other side. So likewise, I put my heart into the book. The book carries it to the reader who then downloads so it's a transaction. So if, and if it's if it's completed fully, the book is entirely appropriated by the reader. So the Leonard and Hungry Paul U experience is the creation of Donald Ryan. They, they are what well, this is sort of like an instruction manual for you to assemble your own characters. Uh, and if your imagination's in good working order, you will experience those as real people. So it, it's it's wholly Absolutely. dependent on the reader. So I, I so I, I'm 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 okay with that. I, I don't I don't sort of it, it, I possibly worried about it a little bit when I was doing Panenka, which is my next book out, uh, which is a different type of book. Uh, but uh, I started thinking, oh, well, people want Leonard and Hungry Paul too, and which some people did, but I said, well, they're going to have to visit me on my planet, I'm afraid. <laughs> <laughs> That's fantastic, Ronan, and it's just such a gorgeous way of putting it, that it's one-to-one -one times a thousand if there are a thousand in the audience, and it's it's so true. Um, and I think it can be so easy for um, anyone engaged in the creative process to almost end up creating by committee by letting all of these voices these hypothetical phantom voices into their heads and and by imagining you know this this huge plethora and this variegated mass of people who might at some stage um consume what you create and and trying to write for every single person differently and that's the idea of keeping it, keeping it intimate is so it's so important that's fantastic um and so how do you find i mean is there a synthesis between your life as a songwriter and not saying your former life as a songwriter but i mean how what's what's harder to do write a song or a story I think I think they're the same. They're just, they're, there isn't the, the analogy I would use is it's a bit like uh, speaking two languages. So when you're if if you only speak English, then all your ideas about language and structure and communication are completely bound mm. up with English. So say you learn Irish or say you learn French or I, I'm currently learning Japanese on Duolingo, right? Oh, brilliant. So, so so they're. They're so entirely different. And then you say, oh, actually, there's there's actually two things here. They look like one thing when I just had one language. But there's the idea and the concepts and what you want to say. And then there's the form of those. And that can have a Japanese form. It can have an English form, an Irish form, French form. But the form is different from the actual idea. So likewise, when you work in more than one form artistically, you realize that there's the idea, which always feels the same, and then just a different form. So... It, it becomes just a technical exercise then about what what is suited to what. But I think I think the real disadvantage writing has, prose writing has, is you don't have melody. A melody feels like a very sort of uh, you know God given, I'm not religious, but a sort of God given sort of thing. It just comes out of nowhere and it really dictates everything. You don't have that in prose writing, so you have to sort of just you have to have a more finely tuned internal radio to pick up what the what the, what the signal is for, for sure writing. yeah god and speaking of that sense of melody um I, I think this book has it you know it this book has such a beautiful rhythm um and it does definitely a kind of melodic feel to it and you know if, if i didn't know that you were a singer songwriter before reading it um i think i might i might have guessed that you that you were a songwriter or musician um with your permission would you mind if i read um one of my favorite um extracts from the book it's just one paragraph where um um where Hungry Paul's parents, um, Peter and Helen, are in. Um, Peter's thinking about them being in a, a zoo in Monterey or an aquarium in Monterey in California, and it's just such a beautiful um, evocation of of love and of kindness. Peter had always said that Hungry Paul was Helen's sunfish. Years ago, before they had kids, Helen and Peter visited the aquarium in Monterey, California. A preference for aquariums over zoos was one of the early examples of how the Venn diagram of their personal tastes often overlapped in idiosyncratic ways. Among the live coral reef sharks, alien jellyfish and camouflage rays was what looked like a floating severed head. A large lopsided sideways swimming fish with reflective skin and a slightly lost expression on its face. It was a sunfish and Helen said it was her favourite. Peter looked at her when she said this. He looked at the concentrated sincerity in her face. Usually he would tease her about being willfully alternative in her choices, but even he knew that this was a very personal moment. Though she didn't say so, he realised that she had picked the sunfish as her favourite because she knew nobody else would pick it. It would have pained 
her beautiful heart to think that there was a living thing that would go through life unloved. And she was compensating for that with a special, deliberate effort to love it. I mean, that's just so beautiful. It's so beautiful. And just the image of, of sunfish, it actually. And then, of course, I realized that's a sunfish on the cover. It's a gorgeous moment. And oh. can you, I, I, I'm always curious about how these moments were created and how the writer felt in the moment of creation. And um, do you remember writing that part of the book? I do. It's funny. Some of the, um, some of the, the, the parts of the book that, you know, I'm happiest with are ones that are kind of one draft and they just come out that way. So I think, I think it's quite, uh, you know, it, it's it, myself, my wife went to Monterey Aquarium and and uh, that's sort of based in our experience and before we had children. But uh, my wife is like that. She she will always she, she will always be for the underdog. Maybe that's why she's with me. But but uh, and I think it's just when it when it came to book where you're doing the cover design and I was asked to try and suggest something that would encapsulate the book. Uh, that seemed to capture, I think, a lot of you know, where the book sort of pivots uh, and it helps explain Helen, I think, and also, mm -hmm. also the perception, I think, maybe of uh, of Hungry Paul as well, the way we sort of look at people. And I've had some lovely emails from people who sort of said, you know, I read the book, my, my son is a sunfish, you know. <laughs> That's lovely. Yeah, it's a, such a gorgeous image and a gorgeous, uh, just a, a gorgeous extract. Um, and I mean, you know, it, it, it does reflect the book as a whole because that's that's the spirit of the book, I think. I think that that, that um, paragraph sums up the spirit of the book and you don't waver from that through, through the book, which is a gorgeous thing. I mean, there's Leonard, Hungry Paul, there's Leonard's mum, there's Helen, Peter, Grace, Andrew, Shelley, um, Patrick as well, but it's also a small host of kind of bit players um, in companies, hospitals, mime associations, supermarkets and it's, it's so this is a world populated by very familiar yet all extraordinary figures um and you know it, 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 it seems to me reading it this must have taken a lot of planning you know that, that all of these people can populate this book um, and in, in such a quiet way but still be so vivid in the reader's imagination and um, but you know it seems to me that maybe maybe they didn't maybe they just kind of walked on did it feel like that as though this kind of milieu just kind of arose as you, as you wrote um because you know these, these small characters could do so much yeah, they just they just arrived. Really, I didn't plan the book at all. Other than I, I knew, you know, a couple of chapters ahead what I would what I would do, and I knew where it, how it would end up. Uh, and I sort of thought, oh, I haven't done a Grace chapter in a while. I better do a Grace chapter, um, or a Hungry Paul chapter. And I, th I think the book is actually quite heavily influenced from me coming out of almost a decade of reading children's books uh, to my kids, where you read and reread. Uh, and the types of characters that are in those books. And I don't know if, if you've ever seen the Richard Scarry books, you know, these are these are mm. brilliant sort of Where's Wally type pictures yeah, of, yeah. Of, of, of a town where there's lots of detail about little incidents. And I've always liked that actually in books and in, in films and, you know, where there are just little openings or even in paintings, just little openings. Sometimes you see a painting and there, it could be an ordinary painting, but there might be a child wearing a red glove or something, or, you know, wearing, you know, there's just a, a little flash or something. Uh, and it just makes it seem a bit more like real life. And I think that attention to to the smaller characters is often, you know, if, if I were sitting down with somebody and going through a draft, I think I would say, well, look, just, just you know, mute all the main characters for the moment. What else is happening around them? Because uh, that's really what builds up the sort of peripheral vision of the reader and the sense of this feels like a real place. Absolutely. It, it, there, are so, there are so many small moments that do such huge jobs of characterization in the book. Like when um, Hungry Paul first meets Mrs. Hawthorne, for example, um, in the hospital and just sits beside her silently holding her hand. I mean, you know, and, and thinking nothing of it, you know, not thinking... I'm being really kind now. I'm doing a good thing. He's just doing it um, because he is innately kind and decent. And it's just such a lovely moment. And, you know, Leonard's interactions with Shelley, um, you know, embarrassed and fumbling as they are at the start, you know, they speak such volumes about who he is and the kind of person he is. Um, it's just it's just gorgeous. Um, there's a lovely quote from you. You said it, it can seem that there's no kindness in the world, but it's often expressed in private. Kindness is a huge, unrecognized force in society. And I mean, that's one thing this book is for sure. It's an absolute expression of the fact that kindness can be a huge, 
unrecognized force in society. And was that kind of a motivating factor behind the book, that expression? Yeah, I, I think certainly in my life, um, I've experienced uh, kindness from a lot of people right from when I was very young. Like my father died when I was seven, right? So my mother, a widow with eight children, five to 19, right? That, that, that was her situation. And one of her best friends for about 10 years called over every Friday to the weekly shopping. I would have gone down and done sort of housework around the house. And one thing about kind people is they will, if you, if you accuse them of being kind, they will utterly deny it. If you say to them, you're very kind, thank you, they go, ah, what are you talking about? Sure, what else would I be doing? So, uh, and that's, that to me is, uh, you know, such a huge binding force in society. And it's not that they are uh, necessarily embarrassed or squeamish about it. It's just when people, when someone's being truly kind, there's almost a collapsing of the distinction between them and the other person. You know, they're, they're not sort of, it's not like they're saying, I'm doing a good thing and I'm feeling good because I'm giving you something. Yeah. It's almost like they don't see anything there's nothing transactional about it at all. They just—they're just doing it as a natural, sort of for you know, social, uh, you know, thing to do, and and I've seen that throughout my life. And it's one of the nice things about one Dublin one book actually, is that a lot of people who I maybe haven't seen since I was younger, you know, friends of my mother's or stuff, uh, you know, have got in touch, and I've been able to send them copies and say, you know, this is inspired by people like you, you know, like, like, I remember all the stuff you did for me when I was young. This is this is about you and, you know, the the, the impression you left on me, you know. That's lovely. That's a really lovely idea. Um, and that's this perfect uh, description and definition of kindness as I've ever heard of true kindness. That's brilliant. And actually, it brings me on to my next question, because um, I noticed in your acknowledgments that you um, that you assure your family that none of the characters are based on them. <laughs> but that might necessarily be quite true. Um, to, to what extent do you think that you, you distill um, people in your life into your characters or your own experience or things you've witnessed or experienced in your life into, into what you write? I mean, it's inevitable, isn't it? There is a bit of that. Sometimes when you're looking for a detail or you're, you're working through a particular... Um, uh, you know, you're trying to give someone a job, for example, or, or you're trying to give someone a bit of backstory, you might draw on some detail. But but in general, uh, those characters, I, I don't I don't really write well from the point of view of trying to transpose a real person into the book. So my my, my family life, as I said, was very, very different. To, um, the, 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 the one thing that, that's probably a bit like my own life is that um, I would have often have gone to my friends' houses and their houses look quite sane to me and nice. And they would have included me, say, if they're going on a day out or something. Yeah. If they just want to come around, you can come with us or stay for dinner. So I was a bit like Leonard in that I was an adjunct member of other people's families. Lovely. Um, so there is a bit of that. But the character, I tend to find, I, I am, I'm not, I think if I try to be faithful to transposing a real life person's mm -hmm. book, I, I would struggle too much of what to keep in and leave out. I, I'm more the kind of person where, I could see somebody in the queue in an airport and you know, you, you're just waiting there yeah. for like four yeah. to five minutes and you, you know, you can, you can be talking to your partner or whatever, and you can build up a whole backstory, you know, for the guy who's, who's, who's in flip-flops mm. uh, or, you know, yeah. someone else who has really elaborate luggage. Uh, and that's all you kind of need. It's just that little bit of a, a hook that you can project from. So it might be somebody, uh, somebody who got on my train for a period of a few months, ten years ago, that I just say, okay, well, I'll, I'll build a character around who I think that person is, and it's kind of liberating because you have you have a reference point, but you're not bound by their actual personality yeah. or their actual. Life. But I've had loads of people say to me, oh yeah, I, I see that that bit about me, yeah, that, that thing I said, yeah. <laughs> Remember that time you said, would you like sugar in your coffee? And now it's in the book. That's from our conversation. Yeah. I'm like. No, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I know the feeling. And that, that's it's, it's such a lovely occupation and lovely pastime. It's something that actually almost got me over my fear of flying was just sitting on a plane and doing that, constructing stories for couples and for people in the other seats um, based on a small queue about them. Um, and that's such a lovely idea about people seeing themselves. I remember my, my oldest friend, actually, when he read Spinning Heart as a draft, he said, Jesus, man, you must really love me. You wrote this book about me, <laughs> but I couldn't. I couldn't fully disabuse him of that because I had. I had used lots of things from his life and from his personality. Um, some of the characters and the main one especially. Um, 
and it's kind of you've kind of already answered it maybe but um is there a particular character in the book with whom you identify most closely or with whom you put into whom you put more more of yourself than others and maybe it's a kind of unfair question i think i think honestly i'm probably most like grace i was thinking about uh, that actually yeah you know i have a, 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 a you know i'm a civil servant a, you know a pretty normal type of job a, a, yeah. you know responsibility i think Grace, there's a bit of camouflaging going on with Grace. I think I think she knows what's expected to her, and she knows how to pull it off, and she sort of puts herself beyond reproach, uh, but has her quiet moments and her mm-hmm. private moments. Yeah, and in that way, she she kind of you can see the, the DNA from Peter to her to, to Hungry Paul, um, but she also has the social side that, that Helen has, and I think I think sort of Grace in some ways represents how society sort of short changes people a bit that if you do everything that's expected mm. of you society just expects more from you uh, absolutely and myself so i have great sympathy with grace as a character and uh i could i could relate to her a lot so really? I, think, I think she's probably doing close to her. i know it's a it's a it's, it's a switch because she, yeah. she, she's a female character but i still i i relate to her a lot she's a great character i mean because she assumes this burden of responsibility that this at one point, Hungry Paul just gently lifts from her shoulders. It's such a, it's such a lovely and profound moment of, of pure familial love. Um, it's just fantastic. Um, so I know you can't say much about a book that isn't published, but, you know, as you wrote Penenka, um, were there echoes of Leonard and Hungry Paul? Were you still hearing those voices? I mean, did, did the writing of Penenka, was it very much influenced by the writing of, of Leonard and Hungry Paul, or was it a totally different experience? Uh, initially, when I started writing it, um, uh, Leonard and Hungry Paul was just coming out or had just come out and I actually had to put Panenka aside for a while because I felt I, I was slipping into that frequency range particularly in the sort of conversations and some of the relationship stuff it was very easy to sort of turn the main sort of relationship in that book into uh, Leonard and Shelley you know and the sort of the goofy sort of jokes and the little asides uh, but I think it's a more serious book in, in that sense, in terms of tone. Um, so I did have to get it out of my mind. And I, I learned a lot doing it. I did a lot of things different as well. You know, just uh, it's, it's aside from it being kind of a slightly sadder book, I think. And but even technically, I did. It, it's quite uh, it's quite clipped. What I mean by that is mm-hmm. there's a lot of hellos and goodbyes in Leonard and Hungry Paul. That doesn't happen in Penenka. You know, it's okay. it's, it's, it's you, the the conver- you join the mid conversation, you leave before the conversation's over. The scenes mm-hmm. are, are quite. Um, you're you're just given the you're just given the burger. You're not given the bun and the yeah. and, and the sauce. You know, you, so they're, they're, it's it's quite lean that way. Um, but I, I think I think one of the things I think as I go to write more books, I have to be careful about is maybe just rereading what I've already done and not covering the same ground and trying to find new spaces, not to try and. Uh, you know, reuse characters. I know what you mean. Um, Because your development as a writer, you say, is based solely on being a reader. Um, You know, you didn't do a course or, um, you know, you didn't ever um, kind of go into any kind of academic um, kind of practice at the act of being a writer. And so, I mean, it's because I think it's one thing that that is very, very important, you know, to to read first before you write. Um, And so are you still a big reader? Yeah, I I, I read a lot. Um, It's still... I'm primarily a reader, I would say. Uh, I, I'm I, I'm a big reader of translated fiction. Uh, you know, uh, as I often say to people, you know, 95% of the people in the world are from countries where English is not the first language. So my reading taste tries to reflect that. So I, I read I read a lot of Japanese literature. Um, I like reading from around the world. I like Egyptian readers. I like South American. I like, um, you know, some really interesting writers coming out of sort of the Balkan area, I think there's a real golden era, I think, of writing from sort of Croatia, Slovenia. Yeah. Um, so I I, I I do have very sort of uh, committed reading habits, but I, but I don't read um, analytically. Like, I, I don't read with a pen in my hand, or I don't say, you know, from a technical point of view, oh, I see what they've done there. Mm-hmm. Like, I, I would notice some things, but I generally try to just receive a book uh, and let it just wash through me, and over time, it just leaves its traces on me. And uh, and I think that helps. Going back to what you were saying earlier about conflict in books, conflict—that idea of conflict—I think is a very anglophone mm. 
a convention in, in narrative structure that you don't see as much in, in other in other styles. Like, for example, I think Leonard and Uncle Paul is probably close enough to a Japanese style, which I only found about after I'd written it, called Kisho Tenketsu, which is which is 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 a very different form of narrative structure that doesn't involve conflict. They use it a lot in manga and stuff like that, but it's also apparently it's it's taught as quite mainstream technique in uh, in some Japan and China. People have told me, although I can't find very much in terms of what's written in English on it. But I think that's an interesting. I think. One thing reading widely across different cultures has taught me is that structure in particular is very local. You know, so the conventions about, for example, an arc is an Anglophone uh, derived approach to structure, which you just simply don't see as much in, in other cultures from, from, from as far as I could tell. That's lovely. Um, that's such a that's such a positive and a lovely way of of talking about reading. And um, that you just received the book um, and not to read analytically, because I I do believe that it ruins the experience of being a reader if you start to analyze everything you're reading. And I I often think that people read with a view to how their reviews want to look on, on Goodreads or Amazon. <laughs> I mean, there's nothing wrong with that, of course. But I think it can you you can. You, you can divest yourself of some of the pleasure of reading if you are going to be a critic as you read. Um, and it, it, it kind of ruins it. It's so true, though, um, about most books being written um, in, in languages besides English. Um, and, you know, I, I think translation is, um, to me, it's a dark art and it's, it's a very particular skill. Um, how do you feel about Leonard Nungri Paul being in translation? I, oh, I'm, I'm very much looking forward to it. It's uh, mm. I have huge time for translators. I think they are... Yeah. Most of this shelf behind me wouldn't exist without them. Uh, and I wrote a short story actually last year in the Irish Times called The Translator's Funeral about the idea of translation. So That's it's right. something I'm really, really interested in. It's, it has been, extracts have been translated uh, into Swedish and Hungarian, and the full book is being translated into Italian at the moment, so it's going to come out. So I'm very interested in seeing how that works out. And I, I actually, I did an interview recently with... Uh, it's sort of an Italian, it's, it's a, a local radio show in Dublin for the Italian community. And the person I was talking to was saying that in Italy, it's a big issue of people still living at home in their 30s, particularly men. Yeah. So she thinks it will be have a very interesting reaction there because the Leonard Nunkley Paul scenario is, hmm. is, is a really talk, talking point there. But I think translation, you know, it is an art form. It, it is uh, everything down to an understanding of the structure of the language you're translating into and certainly humor, I think, is very hard to translate. Uh, yeah. And I think there are all sorts of nuances around some of the idiomatic language that would be very interesting. So I, I think that's a really, uh, it's something I'm really excited about. I would love to see it become available. I know, hopefully, I think there are other discussions going on. Hopefully, it will become available in, in other languages, too. So I, I'd be very excited about that. Well, um, Roland, I really, really hope so, because it truly, truly is um, the kind of book that changes lives. And I, I know you mightn't even, um, you know, it's not something you will say because you're you're quite modest and humble about it. I can see that. But it really is an incredible book. Um, it's a book that I'll, I'll treasure forever, to be honest. And I'm so glad that it's the one Dublin, one book choice for this year, because I really hope that as many people as possible will get to read it um, in translation, in English. In whatever language um it's just it's, it's a really really important book and it really is a tribute to you as a person and to um your life and to the the, the whole idea of kindness and um, i think sue leonard just summed it up she just she just said i adore this quiet contemplative novel um and it is those things but it is it is also extremely powerful um and so i just want to say thanks ronan for, for giving us this book um and thanks to one dublin one book for for choosing it and for making sure that as many people as possible will read it. Leonard and Hungry Paul, it really is a book that should be read by everybody. Thanks so much. Thank you, Donald. It's a really uh, honour to hear you say that and uh, lovely to, to chat to you about writing and uh, really absolutely my pleasure. Thank you very much. Thanks, Roland.